Hello, and welcome to the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. My name is Claudia Rizzini. I'm the executive director of the fellowship program. The Institute is one of the world's leading center for interdisciplinary exploration. We bring students, scholars, artists, and practitioners together to pursue curiosity-driven research, expand human understanding, and grapple with questions that demand insights from across disciplines. You can be a part of this vibrant community by attending public programs such as this one, visiting virtual exhibitions, or pursuing the special collections held at the Schlesinger Library. To learn more, you can visit radcliffe.harvard.edu and sign up to receive more information on news and events. We'll begin the program with a presentation by Chidi Ugu. After the presentation, the speaker will respond to questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time throughout the program. We ask that you keep your questions brief to allow us to address as many as possible in the time that we have together. It is my pleasure to introduce Harvard Radcliffe Institute fellow Chidi Ugu. Professor Ugu teaches anthropology and qualitative methods at the University of Nigeria and Suka, and is a guest lecturer in the University of Melbourne School of Population and Global Health. His research revolves around the unevenness of knowledge and power in the fields of public health, politics, and religion. In particular, he confronts and examines decolonial perspectives on a local level in West Africa through guided and situated autoethnography. Professor Ugu has been published in American Anthropologist, Ethnography, the Journal of Asian and African Studies, The Lancet, The Qualitative Reports, and World Archaeology. His work blends deep knowledge of the topography, ecology, land use, and social structure of the Nsuka area in southern Nigeria, with a forensic sensitivity to the social and economic impact of national and international policy in health. He combines this with a strong engagement of inter international debates with his dis within his discipline and a talent for interdisciplinary thinking and discourse. Arakli Professor Ugu is working on an ethnographic study that examines how practitioners of complementary and alternative forms of care navigate the challenges of patronage in the post-contact era. The goal of this project is to create an original way of observing changes happening to local systems, which remain important despite challenges imposed by the current global order originated by European imperialism. Professor Ugo will examine the subtle ways in which these local systems exert agency by adapting to persist authentically amid Eurocentric modernity. Professor Ugo has a background in cultural anthropology and earned his PhD in social, social anthropology in the University of Nigeria in Suka. His work has been supported through grants from the British Council, the American Council of Learned Sciences, Societies, the Wenner Grant Foundation, the International Development Research Center, and the government of Nigeria. In 2008, a consortium comprising the African German Network of Excellence in Science, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research named him among seven most promising early career scholars in Africa. In 2020, the World's Academy of Sciences selected him for a research cooperation visit to Universität Hamburg, which he will take up in 2022. And now it is my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Chidi Ugo. Thank you very much for the excellent introduction uh, and then um, yeah it's my pleasure to be here and i'll quickly uh, go on to share my screen and okay so thank you uh, ladies and gentlemen for your audience and we'll uh, quickly going to take up the topic of our discussion for the day post-colonial ethnography of subaltern agency and we we'll quickly uh, tell you with this picture you have your story, my story set before you. This is the, the site, the Suka campus of the University of Nigeria. And so part of my land, my father's land, if you like, my ancestral land was taken to build this university. And my father actually even participated in the labor 
that set up the university. My village is somewhere, you know, where that arrow is pointing. So it will make sense to say I grew up in this site that was instituted by the colonial experience. This university is, uh, you, you, you will you'll be right to describe it as the local presence of the external world, you know, in my own local community. So it usually makes sense for me to talk about my experience growing up, the, the epistemic duality. Uh, perhaps I have to move this, to move this. The epistemic dual, duality, you know, what I choose to call epistemic duality of my uh, growing up. Uh, so I was torn between these two worlds where I have to be part of the local life, primordial life, you know, masking and all sorts of traditions that we, we uh, participate in here. And then some, at some point I'll have to go out to the university to mix up attend catechism classes, attend churches, play soccer, make friends with children of professors and workers in the university. So yeah, I was traversing these two worlds and the, the experiences I've had, you know, to be right to, to say that I was shaped in these two publics. And then it always makes sense for me to talk about uh, my experiences growing up in the light of the concepts of these two publics that Professor Peter Eke uh, promoted in 1975 when he wrote about the primordial, you know, the, the post-colonial environments as constituted in two publics. So the primordial, which remains the local, the traditional ways that people have had, you know, and then the civic public is the, those spaces and institutions that well, that became uh, um, that came, you know, in the context of contact, the school system, police, uh, civic, all sorts of institutions, government, and the modern state, and so they they exist side by side with the the rural, primordial, traditional structures that people have had, you know. So and so. My, my formation has happened within this space where you have these two systems coming together. So this is the university and then resting my village uh, on the other end. Okay, so um, I quickly define the key terms that feature in the topic. Subalternity, when you say subaltern, you are really referring to uh, disempowered groups groups that have been disempowered, especially by the structures of Eurocentric modernity. Uh, the experience of colonialism disempowered a, a number of groups uh, who had existed you know, autonomously on their own before encountering uh, the contact, the European uh, contact. So to be a subaltern is to be part of the social categories that have been in one way or another whose powers have been whittled, or you have been disempowered in some way, you are struggling against the more dominant imperial force. So agency is another term that features in the topic, which simply would mean the opposite of, of passivity. To have agency is to have the capacity, the awareness, the consciousness to mobilize uh, the moral, natural, social, legal um, properties around you, appurtenances around you to, to be able to participate in shaping the, so the experiences that happen to you, your social experiences, instead of just lying and waiting for these experiences to just take their toll. So your, your own participation in trying to exert and to assert your own uh, self uh, in, in the process is to have agency. You know, so it, it makes sense for me to use discuss analysis to think about what we are going to discuss. You know, so discuss analysis. I just need you to hold these definitions roughly in hand as we're moving. Discuss analysis is usually. Um, I find it interesting to use it to think about 
how groups struggle against each other in a situation where power is being exerted, but not very frontally. You know, so these different groups meet in the space, the primordial and the civic, and what happens, the communicative processes with which one group wants to, to dominate, to exert uh, itself on the other, you know, also triggers some reverse communicative, you know, process that another group wants to use. To, so that, that very subtle power control and power that people exert through communication, through education, through the media, and how the exchanges that, that go on, you know, is what um, discuss analysts usually focus on. And that's, that's will be useful as we move on, you see. Yeah, so to cut to the chase, general sense of colonial and this colonial, uh, the colonial discursive traditions that I, I, we, have, we read about, uh, usually focus on how coloniality violates and marginalizes non-Western formerly colonized societies. That has been the general focus of, of much of the colonial and the colonial uh, writings. So these are the authors that Edward Said, Chandra Mohanty, Franz Fanon, Omin Baba, Paul Farmer, Mudimbe, and Walter Mignolo. These are the scholars who have been you know, trying to explicate you know, the, the ways in which uh, colonial modernity has, has uh, violated and marginalized the other societies. So uh, then some other scholars have tried to also point out the, the point to the fact that subalterns have their own agency. That is, these, these groups that are constructed as disempowered, they have their own agency. They also exact themselves, they assert themselves in some way. That, and then they say, we must pay attention to how this is being done. So among this group, I thought Clayman man here in Harvard, uh, Kom the Kom uh, Jean Komarov, you know, and the other scholars, Zeta and Basu, Byron Good, a whole lot of them. Okay, so, and some have also focused on the how subalterns resist, the ways in which they resist the, the dominance, you know, from the imperial uh, forces. And uh, among these, you have uh, Subramanian, Emily Martin, Margaret Locke, and Paul Willis, and a whole lot of them, Arthur Clayman, again, features here. Okay, so some uh, scholars have also tried to raise the perspective that there are alternatives to Eurocentric modernity. You know, that Euro Eurocentric development paradigm is not the only paradigm that exists, that we have to think about alternatives to modernity. It's not only the modern states that we know, it's not only the modern medical uh, tradition, you know, that we have to look around to find their, that there are alternatives to ordering our lives instead of just focusing on what the Eurocentric modernity has offered, you know, as if the, it's the only paradigm that, that we have as the alternative. So, and they say we must look around, we must look back, you know, people like Sabelo and Vandana Shiva, John Komarov, you know, Jean Komarov again, and, you know, several of them. So, here is where I, I jump in. And so, Basically, you, if you read these writings, you find that there are two major viewpoints that feature. There's the episodic and the epic views of the colonial experience. The episodic view uh, you know, pro presents the, the, the perspective, you know, argues that colonialism was an event that happened and is now in the past, that people should move on. You know, people should forget about it. it was an event that happened that people should just move on and forget about, you know, um, uh, just focusing on it as if, you know, life ends there. Then you have the epic viewpoint that makes the opposite argument, you know, that says that everything we experience today, you know, is based on the, the structures and the institutions and the values that colonialism put in place, that you can't move on from there because that, that is the foundation. You know, and they refer to uh, America and say it, 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 um, people 
cannot be told not to talk about racism and slavery in America. They refer to other, you know, institutions, other uh, viewpoints, and they they maintain that epic view is the way to go. And I I actually you know I buy this viewpoint uh, because it's equivalent to talking about Western where the West is today, without mentioning the Enlightenment, for example. You know, it, so the things have their foundations and we can't run away from that. I believe that, you know, we should focus on that and, and talk about them. Yeah, maybe I have to move this again. So, but, but I extend from this, right? Where this is where I want to offer my own contribution. I'm extending from the colonial and the colonial discursive tradition uh, to, because I find, not begrudging the arguments they make, but I find that at some point they tend to oversimplify and overgeneralize a, romant over a romanticized pre-colonial past, you know, presenting the pre-colonial past as some sort of paradise that we have been deprived of and that we should strive to return to. Yeah, I'm not saying this, there was no paradise, but most times these things are romanticized so much that you know you find if you read the history closely you find that this thing uh, is not usually at some point it's not realistic okay so they also focus on the damage they tend to focus on the damage of, of colonialism and at the risk of being negative you know it, it tends not to produce positive knowledge you know about what was the way forward so, and then I ask myself, are there no local systems that are surviving and advancing in the midst of coloniality? You know, are we only to focus on the things that colonialism destroyed? Are there things we can see, institutions, local systems we can see surviving and thriving, you know, despite the colonial, uh, the coloniality? So, and then I also ask myself, if we can find this, in what ways do they, you know, they, does this unfold? So, and when I looked around, I find very, something very happening, very interesting among the people who are called folk practitioners or, you know, folk healers, traditional healers, and they both sacred and the secular. Those, the sacred, traditional, uh, practitioners are those that involve some sort of ritual and some spiritual supernatural angle to what they do. The secular folk healers are those that do not lay claims to some supernatural power. They only focus on using herbs and roots and backs of trees and fruits and parts of animals to enact their own healing. Okay. So, but I, I, I look and then find that scholars have also been trying to study folk healing in different spaces, different societies, and in, in different ways. So much of the studies have focused on the intricacies of the practice, folk, the things they do, right? How they perform their rituals, the things they collect, and you know, the, the incantations they make, and all sorts of things. People have been invested in studying this thing. Others have also been invested in looking at how the traditional healing has been shifting, how it has been absorbing practices from external, how it has been, what is called syncretism or indigenization, you know, how they have been trying to accommodate, to shift, to, to absorb, to, to borrow practices from the um, civic from the modern medical tradition. So some have also focused on how all sorts of resistances that they have been trying to put up against these foreign systems that have besieged them. You know, the Christian religion, the modern states, um, biomedicine, these are the forces, the imperial dominant forces that they are, they are up against. And, you know, what are the things they have been doing to resist being dominated, being run out of business? So some have focused on it. 
Yeah, so um, what is my agenda? The interesting perspective I bring is, you know, preliminarily I observed that the traditional healers in southern Nigeria, you know, I live in Nsuka and that's, I move around a lot, you know, different parts of Nigeria, but my study has to be localized in some place to be able to have the dense, you know, uh, kind of narrative that you need to present as an ethnographer. So I see that they, there are something they are doing to mobilize the properties, the alliances, the technologies, the features of Christianity and biomedicine to mobilize what they have, those things that they are using the, to attract people, to hold people down. There's a way the traditional, the folk healers are also mobilizing those things and to use those as the facade, if you like, the, the smoke screen to attract people to themselves while they, they keep the core of the practice that, that they want to keep. Okay, so you are going to see how this actually happens. So, and then they, they use these um, appurtenances if you like, to promote their own practice. And these are the, this is the story I'm going to tell how they also downplay the imperial order, the biomedicine, you know, especially how they use the weaknesses they notice in biomedicine to, to demarket biomedicine in the process of, of also promoting their own practice. So my methods, ethnography uh, is a method of doing research where you immerse yourself in the social group, the social processes you want to report in order to be able to report that process from the point of view of a member of that group. You know, so that, that is ethnography. So there are different strands, different roles you can play as an ethnographer. If we talk about this in the next one, uh, it may not be over, but just to tell you briefly, I'm playing the role of a participant as observer. That is an observing participant is the ethnographer that was already a member of the process before you took up the study of that process, before deciding to take up. So that, that this would be a participant as observer. So, and this process is called naturalistic because it unfolds, you know, it's not something you set out, it's not formalized. You know, so that, that's why some people call it naturalistic. It's something that happens naturally, experientially. You know, so and if it happens, if, if it becomes something you if you are reporting your own group, right, your own tradition, then you know people choose to call it indigenous ethnography. And if what you are reporting involves your own practice, the things that have happened to you, you have played part of the process, you are telling the story from your own personal experiences, uh, you know, so. People choose to call it autoethnography. That is your like autobiography. You know, you are writing about yourself and the experiences that are shaping the, the things you want to report. So, but in addition, I, I also play, you know, some formal ethnographic role that involves going out to ask questions, to meet with people, to form a research question, research agenda, and then move out to collect some focused information about it. In addition to being a member of any group, you have to do this because you can't get all the experience that is available in a social space. You have to talk about to talk to others to see how they experience that. So I've had to do that a number of occasions. You know, this is so I, I write up about people who look like me, who speak my language. You the paper is the only site of tension. You know, whenever I bring out a paper or a recorder, you know, whatever it is that has the capacity to transmit the contents of the local life to the outside, then it creates tension. People get focused, people get conscious, people get concerned, you know, and then people begin to talk as they would talk to an outsider because they are already imagining that whatever they are saying is, is being transmitted to the outside world. Anyway, this is a story for another day, but yeah, so 
what is the clinical reality in this place? So clinical reality is what Arthur Kleinman has suggested to capture uh, the social and cultural and structural context within which sickness and healing happen. Not just the medical experience, but the cultural context, the social context, the structure, whatever it is that, uh, you, know, that you find in the context of healing and sickness and illness. It's what you call clinical reality. So the clinical reality in this space, in this um, locus you know, that I'm reporting about, is that folk healing has remained inevitable. That is traditional healing has continued to thrive. It's a place where traditional healing continues to thrive. And the reality is that Biomedicine is limited in many ways in terms of it's alienated from people, it's limited to just the vertical, body-centered, germ-centered, you know, kind of healing that focuses on the germ, focuses on the body. It does not consider the other social and structural aspects of healing. And even the WHO in 1948 and then uh, the Amata Declaration of 1978 agreed you know tacitly right that biomedicine is limited in these ways and that is why they defined health as not just the absence of disease but a state of physical mental and social well-being you know so they defined healing in a way that limits that puts it beyond the limits of, of biomedicine anyway so that's that's part of the social reality and another aspect of this reality here is the social embeddedness of folk practitioners. This is something that gives them an advantage that the biomedicine doesn't have. You know, folk healers are part of the social group they, they, that form their clients. You know, they, 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 they grew up, they live in this, within this group, they have the same social historical experiences uh, within this group, and they have the native wisdom that you require to be able to attend to the health needs of members of this group. And this is an advantage that, have, uh, that has keep, kept you know, folk healers, you know, giving them that edge that they have you know, and, and keeping them in business. Anyway, so, so when people are, grow up, um, the picture that people have about folk healers is this picture, right? The, what people have been told, even without having seen it, somehow when you see these people think that this is how folk healers look, right? This is wrong. I have never seen a folk healer, I've visited several of them in my community. I've never seen a folk healer looking like this, right? But this is the picture with which you are indoctrinated. If you, if you read books you know, about people who have this biomedical bias and the Christianized kind of sense, they, this is the kind of picture they paint, you know, a picture of one haggard looking you know, old man. So this is, this, is how, this is how really folk healers look sacred and secular. They all look like normal human beings. They dress like you, they look like you. This is how they appear, right? So uh, this is one of them, one picture I managed to take in one of my visits. In, uh, but so we'll get back to this picture. Now, because people have been indoctrinated, if you like, or desocialized, have been made to think that what happens in spaces like this are fetish. They are backward. They are devilish. And then this is presented, Jesus and uh, whatever, you know, the foreign religion is presented as the civilized, redemptive kind of religion that you should, you know, move into. And because religion and healing in traditional societies are entangled, 
you know, they, you don't have this kind of formalized, bureaucratized division of labor you have in the Western order of things. You, things are um, do not have that kind of, they are that fuse, you know, with the social, religious, you know, medical experiences that people have. So most healers have morphed into this, right? So they dress like priest, Christian priests and they fill their spaces with pictures of Jesus Christ and cross and Virgin Mary and the design, the design is, looks like a space you find in a normal Western space. You know, so, and if you go to the, <laughs> into their spaces, you find things like this, altars that look like those things you have been socialized to accept as the right religion, the one that offers redemption, they present, they prepare their social spaces to also look that way, you know. So this is, this is, a, this is the smoke screen you want to see. Since you have been socialized, to want to see, to accept this kind of, you know, picture, this kind of imagery, they present it before you. So why, why also keeping what they want to, to protect behind it? Okay. So, yeah, but when I visited, one day I visited a traditional healer and um, I just quickly just wanted to know him. He began to tell me that he's a traditional doctor you know, already mobilizing the doctor persona. You know, the doctor is the person in the Western sense who heals the sick, right? So he's a doctor also, even though he's traditional, he can't deny being traditional, but he's, he also tells you that he performs that duty that you assign to the doctor. And so, and this is how, you know, the impression management that happens in that process, had the, 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 he tells me that he brings spiritualism into herbalism, you know, and they are, they are the same thing. And then even begins to quote uh, the Bible to back it up. And uh, so you see that the Bible verse, you know, uh, Jeremiah chapter one, verse five and all that. So because they, they know the space that where they are operating, where people are religious, people have been converted to Christianity and all that. So the attempt to use the Christian Bible to validate their practice is a very measured, intentional kind of a, a communicative action. So, but, but something begins to jump at you when, when you, you know, it, it, I began to interact with uh, this man. The next thing he says is that, you know, I know the big churches around town, I want to find out why I am really doing that, what, uh, what I'm really doing that makes my healing more effective than theirs, you know. Already speaking to the Christian churches, and this, is, this already shows you the forces, the imperial forces they are up against, and he's already raising, you know, that red flag, you know, imagining that I came, I, I came as a spy, you know, sent by the church to come and spy on him and all that. But this begins to tell you the forces that he's, he's scared of, the forces they are battling against. You know, it's what, you know, Christian churches, one of the, the imperial forces that are up against them. You know, so, but I tell you something. This is a man that quoted the Bible for me the first time we met. Second time we met, he begins to, uh, raise some scare, you know, about the possibility of my having been sent by the church to spy on him. And then after I had familiarized myself and visited, you know, several times and had become almost part of the space, because what he does is to heal the mentally sick. So one day I was just seated around with him. A certain family was there and he was talking relaxed and in a very calm manner. And then one of the, the statements that jumped from him was, you know, they were, they were discussing land. You know, a certain family was dragging a piece of land with him and he said they were threatening to kill him, to poison him. You know, so, and so one of the statements he dropped is that those people threatening to kill me over that land will soon realize between us whose charm is more potent. You know, that's the way you talk about prayer as charm. 
this is a man that quotes the Bible, he sings praises, and but you know, there's a way you talk about charm in among the ego that begins to refer to prayer. You know, people say that prayer is the charm, is my charm. But in this context, he didn't he wasn't pretending that he was talking about prayer, he was talking about actual charm, right? So um but, but he could only say this because um, he already was feeling confident in my presence and didn't, didn't care so much what I would go to report to the outside world about his practice. And it, this becomes interesting. Uh, so just to tell you how the, the public imagery, the impression management that folk traditional healers, folk practitioners are already are using to, to present, to represent their practice in a space where they know that people are driven already by how much those of the Christian message that they have acquired. So, and this is, this is shaping the practice and the public imagery that these people present. Just listen to this very short, just watch this very short. I'm not stealing, my God will bless you. Once up in the woman, he does worry. My God will bless you. I may be the governor. If God Almighty that have money, that have water, no woman being on earth, there's the only one power and then the only one God. Jehovah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. You can see that, you know, just using that, you know, Jehovah and God and to, to validate. Ordinarily, this, this is a ritual. But that happens ordinarily. This is a traditional ritual process. But you have to use something that people generally accept to validate this. And this is any other God you know it does not what is going on. So this is a this is a man that does some performs some ritual for people who want to make money, right? So um, we we talk about whether this fits into traditional healing or not. You know, this this is a long story, but it, it's not. You can remove this from the whole gamut of traditional folk healing because these things are lumped. People who do this also do all sorts of healing, and they even see social well-being which you can bring which money can attract as part of health is a part of what people need to be to feel well okay, i'm not so. stealing my god will bless you all right that's all right so he's just spreading money so this is meant to attract money and then he's spraying money you know ritually to, to get them to attract money when they go out for to fend for themselves. And then what, what I really need, God, need you to see, Satan. what I really, really need you to see is something that haps, happens towards the end, you know, the, the speech that happens. I'm not wasting money, neither. I'm helping people to get money from God, not from Satan. If they get money, they will help. Then we help their, their governments. We are helping governments because if you raise the billionaire, I will raise their own community. So I bless your city in the mighty name of Jesus. All the prophets that I respect so much in the world, Apostle Justin Suleiman, Prophet Jeremiah, all my brothers in the Christendom, I greet you. Let up a day to come back up one and a cable. I come with the name Uno Nama. I greet all of you. It shall be well with all of you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that video, that short video you watched is a certain man called <laughs> Prophet, you know, Prophet Onyeze Jesus, you know. So he does these things, and then what, what you see unfolding is and attempts to close this practice, to wrap it with a cloak of Christianity, of, you know, because you see how he uses Christianity. And you see, I just managed to transcribe this to quickly show you, uh, just to quickly show you some of the, the things that will uh, interest. 
So it's God Almighty that owns money, right? I, I just managed to transcribe it in uh, a better uh, for a better understanding. Uh, so you see how God is roped into the whole practice. It's God that owns money. It is God that owns water. And in the same breath, he's calling Agbala, right? He's, at some point, he says that if you if you give to Agbala, is the the river goddess in his community that he traditionally relies on to perform ritual. But he has to close that ritual in, you know, with the cloak of God and the, the um, Christianity first, and then manages to steal in the Abala, you know, just to still show you that he's keeping the tradition, the, 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 the deity, if you like, the, that, that gives potency to what he does. He's still somewhere lying be, uh, beneath, but the picture, the, the clothing you have seen covering it is the God Almighty, you know, that he wants to present. You know, and then he goes on to, to even the critique, to tell you where the critique is coming from. He faces the public, faces the camera, and begins to address people that are speaking against me. Right? And this speaks to the critical public, the public who are talking about what he does and then saying it is the devil's work and that God does not do money, support money ritual. So he begins to address them, and while he continues to make efforts to clothe this thing, you know, with the cloak of Christianity and the Christian God. Okay, so, and he says it is from God, not from Satan, right? So th this effort is measured. If you, if you pay attention, you see that very sustained effort to, to, to decouple from whatever uh, devil, sense of devil or evil that people may have about what he's doing and, and to clothe it with, with God and Christianity and, you know. So, and you see how government, the, the rationalization that ropes government into the whole process. You know, how if you help people to get, get money, you're helping government, right? If you, are, you are, if you raise a billionaire, you raise their own community. He talks about the economic relevance of what he does, the relevance, political re relevance of what he does, even the security relevance of what he does. All this is measured strategy that is happening in a very complex communicative process that you need to, to, to speak to all the possible publics that will be interested in this, in this matter. You know, you are trying, he's trying to lump, to address everyone and to address everyone's concern including the politicians, the Christians, the whoever, you know, it's a very complex thing happening here, but you think it's, it's very simple if you don't pay close attention. You know, and, that, and then at the end, he begins to hail the prophets and he begins to greet. What happens is you only have to know the Nigerian environment to understand the complexity of this short video. You know, the, the prophets he mentions, the people he greets in the end are, People, Nigerians call men of God that are very popular and is very intentional in terms of how he selects the, those prophets that he mentioned. You know, one was a prophet, one is, a, is a, 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 a priest, if you like, a pastor who hails from the place that is called Niger Delta, South South Nigeria. And then the second person he selects is someone who hails from southern, from Western Nigeria. The, the next he selects is the most popular priest in Eastern Nigeria. You know, trying to, 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 to bundle this public and to address all sections, not just geographic, not just in terms of religion and the persuasion, political persuasion, but even in terms of geography. You know, so people who are in Eastern Nigeria like a certain reverend father, and then he picks that. And people from Southern Nigeria, from Eastern Nigeria, they, they, they are, they are in very influential men of God in these places. And then he intentionally picks one from each zone uh, of Southern Nigeria, where you have majority uh, Christian. You know, as against the North, where you have a lot of Muslims and, you know, so. Um, and then you see the picture, one of the pictures he uses to advertise himself. And you see the imagery that is being presented here, angel and angel and, you know, and his dress, you can see the dress like a normal 
you know, um, um, priests, Christian priests. Uh, so this is this is appealing to that sensibility you have that you have been prepared by being part of a post-colonial process that produces people produces, uh, people who think in a certain way, who see the, su the supernatural in a certain way. So this, this thing is being packaged to appeal to you as this is a smoke screen that gets you close to, so, so that the, you, you come and be part of that practice you are running away from. Okay. So let's quickly get over to the, <laughs> the secular folk practitioners, right? Those who use roots and herbs and the backs of trees. And this is the, the picture that people have about, about herbal healing, right? That the, the, and this picture is being promoted by the biomedical practitioners, even the Christian uh, people who are you know, biased towards Christianity. This is the picture they present, you know, a rough and tumble, unorganized, unhygienic kind of space. And so um, the heat became so much that the practitioners had, had to do something about it. And then this is what, so one, one of them I visited, this is like a home that had, where you have collected these things. And, and then you had to move from what looks like this to the pharmaceutical, right? So these are traditional, these are herbs and roots and backs of trees and parts of animals. And, but since people are being, uh, since, since they are being maligned for not be not refining, for not appearing civilized, if you like, for not appearing refined, they also have to do something that looks like the pharmaceutical. So this is it. And part of the criticism has been that they are not measured. They, you know, this is how they move into the market. You know, and so I, I, I'll tell you a more complex story now. This is my neighborhood. This is. Uh, you know how they market their what they they, they sell. This is uh, one of the vehicles they use to move around. Okay. Now, one of the criticisms that the herbal healers face is that they don't have specifications. They are not measured. They are not. They don't have date of manufacture. They don't have dosage. They don't have information in terms of contraindication. They don't have. They, they, they are not, they don't have information, right? So they have provided the information. This is a typical, you know, uh, herb packaged in certain, herbs and roots packaged in certain way. So, and you have, still have the doctor persona that you need to see, you know, so this is not a doctor a trained in, in the kind of medical tradition, but uh, a herbal healer who claims the doctor persona because he also heals and he thinks he, had, he has been trained. He has also gone through training and should be referred to as a doctor. Anyway, but so that's, that's not the main story. So you have here, you have storage information. You said they didn't have storage information. Here you have it. You said they didn't have information in terms of contraindication. Here you have it. You said they didn't have all these details, batch number, date of manufacture, there you have it. You know, uh, date of expiry, you have all that. Government registration even, you know, they, they have managed to be getting all that. You know, so it gets even more interesting, ladies and gentlemen. You, here you find the dosage, here you find active ingredients, all the details you need. And then it gets more interesting to, where they demonstrate that they are more embedded, they, they, they respond more to the sensibilities of the people you find in this space than the, the, the medical tradition does. Here you have Bible verses that you need to read as part of the healing process, part of the process of taking this. And then because this place is the, 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 where I, I took this picture, it, I bought this you know, to, to do this for this research is a dominant, Catholics, right, are, are dominant in the population of these people. And this picture of the uh, Mary, you know, whom Christians believe uh, gave immaculate conception, 
had immaculate conception and gave birth to Jesus the Christ. Uh, so Catholics revere her a lot. So it makes sense to use her picture as part of the strategies to attract, you know, clientele for this particular help. And then there's something Chidi, that- Chidi, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry to interrupt you. This is such a fascinating uh, topic. Uh, we wanted to leave the time for a couple of questions. So if you can get to your closing remarks, I think that you've made a lot of points clear. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay, so quickly just to end, just to show, uh, this is you know the communicative process that happened. Um, I wouldn't have time to say, but I think I have made the points that needed to be made here. And uh, um, okay, so just to, to say one last thing about how they push back against the um, biomedical practitioners. Um, yeah, which I, I, I didn't manage to get the time to say. But anyway, closing. Um, I already made this point, I, I believe. This is just to conclude the, the points I have made and to tell you that uh, what makes ethnography, what it is, is uh, the micro, it becomes the micro history for the future because it tells all the stories that the future will need to read and see, really see what happens. Now I'll throw it back to for... Thank you, Chidi. This was absolutely fascinating talk, really uh, incredibly interesting. So let me get to the first question for you. In your concept of participant as observer, your work is powerful partly because you are reporting about a community you were part of prior to your research. How long is it enough, is enough to embed uh, for embedding rather than parachuting parachute studies? Okay, um, usually it, it, it depends on the nature of your study, but traditionally you have to spend at least one year to embed, one year to learn a system because most things that happen in most societies take a, a cycle of one year. Even if you are studying um, system of education, it usually happens the semester, first semester, second semester, whatever you are studying, Harvest, um, cultivating and harvesting, almost everything happens. So you have to stay the cycle to be able to say you have seen enough to be able to report. But the longer you spend, the more embedding you have, the more information you will get. But it may never be enough, even if you're a member of that group. Perfect. The second question is, given, Niger uh, given Nigeria is a Muslim majority country, do you, any traditional healers borrow from Muslim symbols? as well to justify the practice. Is there a reason it is easier to borrow Christian symbols if that is the case? Okay, yes. Yeah, there are people who have studied also focused on the, in Northern Nigeria where you have uh, Muslims, but it's, it's a matter for another day. We, we can't talk about that. Muslims are not in the majority, but there's not a, a political uh, topic. We won't get into that, but there are people who have studied Northern Nigeria, like practitioners in Northern Nigeria, where you have a, a, a lot of uh, Muslims who have also shown how they are borrowing from Islam and, you know, the kind of the indigenization process that is happening within that space where Islam, you know, people like Muriel Last and, you know, a lot of them who have focused on that, you know, so um, I think it's something we can find time to talk more about. Mm -hmm. um... Early in your uh, talk, you noted that colonialism stays with us. It seems as if Western thinking has helped define the ways people have constructed their collective identities in Nigeria. I wonder, have you thought about the ways collective identity plays a role in the ways faith healer shape, shift to remain their authentic selves? <laughs> yes, yeah, it's an interesting. Uh, question. Um, yeah, so I think that the religious healers, even the folk, uh, the secular healers, are responding to the kind of identities that people have seen themselves that they have in this um, modern uh, context. So 
people define themselves in certain ways and these definitions that people have of themselves are shaped by the experiences that they have encountered. So it's a very complex thing to talk about the collective identities in Nigeria, they are, they are in different layers. But Christianity is one of them. There are people who define themselves as Christians. You, inside it, you have people defined as Catholics and the Protestants and the, all, all sorts of. So, but every majority of the people define themselves in ways that are acceptable within the Christian, you know, Christian teachings. And then, so because of this, they are in the majority. The faith healers are responding to this majority, you know, to because they know that this is the market, if you like. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So the use of Christianity to clothe the traditional practices of traditional religions seems similar to the use of Christianity to clothe capitalist desires for material wealth that we know as the prosperity gospel in the US. Is there such a prosperity gospel being preached by Christian ministers in Nigeria? <laughs> yes, a lot. There's no place where um, Christianity has gone that it hasn't influenced uh, the, how things unfold. Um, and so economics really is, you, those who have read Marxism, you know, economics is the structure, the infrastructure, you know, that shapes other Super parts of the superstructure, like even religion. And um, so the kind of preaching that people do, and even the kind of rituals that happen now, the one I showed you is about people going to make money. The, the preachings that happen, the messages that are released about how to make you more prosperous. And they know that this is what people have been shaped by the economic, you know, the neoliberal, if you like, the, the, the messages that are coming in, in the wake of capitalism. People have been conditioned to want to own property, to, to own a lot of wealth. And you have to respond, you have to speak to this desire for you to remain relevant, whether you're a pastor or traditionalist or whatever. So what happened in the US, the economic system was exported first, uh, where they went hand in hand with the missionaries, but these messages cannot be disconnected from, from one another. A lot of prosperity preaching is happening in Nigeria because Nigeria has also been influenced by you know, the flow of, of the spirits of capital. Mm -hmm. Well, this is all we have time of, uh, for today. Thank you, Chidi, for your uh, fascinating presentation and your perspectives. I also want to thank you, the audience, for the, que their question, the terrific questions. I hope you'll be able to join us for other Rackleaf virtual programs. You can find out about future programs and watch videos of past events at rackleaf.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.